Hello, this is David Tuchel with a Hariba Scientific Raman Academy video. Uh, this one on photoluminescence spectroscopy using a Raman spectrometer. And to begin, we want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of the difference between Raman scattering and photoluminescence. So we're going to do that through our understanding of molecular spectroscopy and considering some molecular energy level diagrams. So what we see here is a uh, molecular energy level diagram of, shall we say, a generic molecule. And the interaction of a photon with this molecule such that the incident photon is not absorbed. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, we've got two electronic states indicated here, E sub 0, E sub 1, which are the ground and the first excited electronic states, respectively. And within each of these electronic states, you have a manifold of vibrational energy states, nu sub 0, nu sub 1, nu sub 2. And in this case, uh, let's talk about elastic light scattering or Rayleigh scattering first, and that's shown right here, where the molecule is originally in the ground, excited, and vibrational states. And as we said, it's not a resonance condition, so the energy of the incident photon is not sufficient for an electronic transition. That is to say, no absorption occurs. The molecule is essentially transparent to this radiation. However, uh, the interaction uh, with uh, the molecule with a photon can bring the molecule to what's quantum mechanically described as a virtual state where a photon can then be scattered uh, at, in this case, at the same energy, frequency, and wavelength as that of the incident photon. So there's no transfer of energy whatsoever, hence it's called elastic light scattering or Rayleigh scattering. Now you can also have inelastic light scattering, which is Raman scattering, and that can be either by Stokes or anti-Stokes Raman scattering. Stokes is what uh, most of you are doing, Stokes Raman scattering, because the ground vibrational state is the most heavily populated, so therefore it's going to give you the stronger signal. So the molecule originates in the ground vibrational state, and uh, again, upon interaction with the photon, goes to the virtual state, whereupon a transfer of a quantum of energy has occurred such that the molecule now ends up in the first excited vibrational state, and the Raman photon that's scattered has an energy less than that of the incident photon. Okay, so the energy is less, the frequency is less, and the wavelength is longer than that of the incident photon the molecule ends up in the first excited vibrational state. And you could see then the complementarity of Raman scattering to infrared absorption because in infrared absorption, the molecule ends up in the same vibrational state but through a different route, through direct absorption of a lower energy, uh, longer wavelength photon. Now you can also have anti-Stokes Raman scattering where the molecule begins in the first excited vibrational state ends up in the ground vibrational state so a quantum of energy has been transferred from the molecule in this case to the photon and so the photon now has an energy and a frequency greater than that of the incident uh, of the incident uh, uh, light and uh, so this will be on the uh, shorter wavelength side of the laser line in the Stokes Raman scattering, you uh, detect your Raman scattered light on the longer wavelength side of the laser line. Now this is for the case of non-resonance, that is to say where there's no absorption of the incident light. Now what can happen if absorption is occurring? So our energy level diagram appears different now, and we have the case where the interaction of the molecule with the photon drives that molecule to the first excited electronic state where you can get resonance enhanced Raman spectroscopy. But that's not the topic of this video. What we want to talk about here is uh, the phenomenon of fluorescence. So 
this uh, photon is absorbed by the molecule. It can then end up in a number of vibrational states uh, in this uh, first excited electronic state, whereupon it undergoes relaxation and transition, radiationless transitions, such that from the ground vibrational state, a photon can be emitted, that's the fluorescence, and the molecule can end up in a variety of different vibrational states of the ground electronic states. And that's what gives you either the fine structure uh, or depending upon the molecular interactions, let's say in a solvent or a surrounding solid, then the breadth of the uh, fluorescence or emission bands that you see. So that's the difference between Raman scattering and fluorescence. The thing is is they can both appear in the same spectrum uh, and uh, be generated from the same experiment because you're basically exciting with this wavelength and then the different processes can occur if you are uh, basically in resonance with an electronic transition. So here's an example of spectra consisting of both Raman bands, which you see here, as well as photoluminescence. And these spectra were obtained from uh, exfoliated few layer two dimensional molybdenum disulfide. And these spectra were acquired from the very same location on the flake, excited with different excitation wavelengths, color coded here. So the blue spectrum was excited with 532 nanometer excitation, and the red spectrum with 633 nanometer excitation. And these spectra are plotted on a wavelength scale, not Raman shift, but a wavelength scale. Therefore, you can see the differences in Raman scattering and photoluminescence because the Raman bands are always a shift relative to the laser line. They're always a constant energy value shifted with respect to the energy of the laser line. So at 532, we go to the particular frequencies, red shifted with respect to the laser line, and here the Raman bands appear, same thing for the 633 nanometer excitation. But the emissions, photoluminescence, or more generally termed photoluminescence, all occur at the same absolute wavelength. So that on this wavelength scale, we see for both excitations, emissions at 691 and 930 nanometers. Notice too that um, by choosing different excitation wavelengths, it allows you to probe these electronic transitions because you see how the relative intensities of these emissions are inverted uh, depending on whether you're using the 532 or 633. That is to say, at 532 nanometer excitation, the 930 emission is stronger than that at 691, and with 633 nanometer excitation, uh, it's the inverse. This is the weaker of the two emissions. Now here are spectra consisting of principally Raman bands, so we'll call them Raman spectra, of corundum aluminum oxide with chromium present as an impurity, and these spectra were obtained at 532 and 633 nanometer excitation. And so the Raman bands that you see here are labeled, they're peak positions are labeled 144, 417, 568, and 734. And our scale now is Raman shift, not wavelength, but Raman shift. And what we see are the Raman bands, but we also see some photoluminescence peaks. Why do we know that they're photoluminescence? Because they're not present at the same Raman shift in both of these spectra. And they originate from the chromium that's present, and specifically chromium in the 3 plus oxidation state. So elemental chromium has an electronic configuration of argon with five electrons in the 3d orbital and one in the 4s orbital. But present in the aluminum oxide corundum, chromium will occupy the aluminum site and have an oxidation state of 3 plus and therefore its outer shell orbital will have just three electrons and in the, D, uh, in the 3D orbital, and therefore you have the opportunity for uh, T2G to EG transitions uh, in both absorption and uh, photoluminescence. So if we look now out at longer wavelengths uh, from, these, uh, from the same material, 
excited with 633, 532, and 405, and we have them plotted on a wavelength scale, you see that at the same wavelengths, you see these two closely spaced emissions from the uh, 3 plus oxidation state of chromium. And these emissions, uh, when we look at them very closely, they're closely spaced and well resolved because of the fact that we're using a Raman spectrometer with the ability to resolve closely spaced uh, vibrational transitions. So we see these well-known peaks from uh, chromium 3 plus, the so-called R2 and R1 bands, at 692.8 and 694.2 nanometers. Now what I'd also like to point out to you is this peak that appears at 810 nanometers in the spectrum excited with 405 nanometers, where it's not present in these other two. Now why is that? Because basically this is a second order passage of the 405 nanometer light. That is to say your grading has multiple orders. All right, And so the first order is what's being used normally to do your spectroscopy, but the second order will pass through uh, at the multiple wavelength of the light that struck it. So we have a laser at 405. This peak that uh, appears at 810 in your spectrum is actually the second order of 405 nanometer light. So you need to be aware of that when acquiring spectra where you could cover wavelengths that um, may be multiples of your first order excitation. Now we saw how well the uh, Raman spectrometer works at resolving transitions uh, or uh, uh, bands from uh, electronic transitions from transition metals. Here we have a case where uh, we're looking at the photoluminescence spectra of erbium oxide excited at 405, 532, and 633 nanometer excitation. Now erbium has, uh, elemental erbium, has the electronic configuration of xenon with 12 electrons in the 4f orbital and 2 in the 6s orbital. But bound to oxygen in erbium oxide, the erbium then has a 3 plus oxidation state and therefore just has 11 electrons in the 4f orbital. Now normally the parity selection rules are such that the electronic transitions should be uh, should be just from f to d orbitals, but because the erbium uh, is slightly off the center of inversion symmetry, the FF orbital transitions, that is to say within the 4F, uh, uh, 4F shell, they are weakly allowed and therefore you can see them uh, in the spectra excited at the different wavelengths. And the reason that they're so very well resolved, that you see all this fine structure here, is because they're essentially like atomic spectra. That is to say the F orbitals are not part of the chemical bonding so there's no coupling to the oxygen and therefore these transitions are shielded from the bonds to the surrounding atoms and therefore you see this fine structure which uh, shows up so well again when using a Raman spectrometer. You can also see that by using the different excitation wavelengths you can couple into different transitions uh, and uh, you see you particularly notice that in if we look at the region between say 535 to 720 and we see that at 633 and 405 nanometer excitation we have these clusters of uh, emissions or bands right here that show up for both of those excitations but very weak with 532. Likewise you can see some peaks here when excited at 405 they're absent when excited at 633 and 532. And you also see variation in the relative intensities here as well. Now, here are some other spectra of a lanthanide, neodymium, this time doped in glass. And its electronic configuration for the element is xenon uh, with four electrons in the 4F shell and two in the 6S. But uh, 
it very readily forms uh, the 3 plus oxidation state which will leave you with uh, three electrons in the 4f orbital and in this case what we see for all three excitation wavelengths is basically the same spectrum and you notice that there's very little fine structure here fairly broad which is a very good indication that in this case the transition is in fact between the f uh, orbital and the d orbital now why is that because the d orbitals of the neodymium is going to couple much more strongly to the surrounding uh, oxygen of the glass uh, than will the f orbitals so there you see basically you can use the uh, laser excited uh, photoluminescence with a Raman spectrometer to be able to probe differences in the electronic transitions and their coupling to the surrounding material and of course here's our 810 nanometer line which as I've said before is the passage of the 405 nanometer light the laser light uh, from the second order of the grading so let's conclude then this uh, short presentation with uh, these um, learnings if you will number one that photoluminescence and Raman spectroscopy can be performed simultaneously with a Raman spectrometer secondly Raman scattering occurs at a specific Raman shift relative to the excitation wavelength therefore the Raman bands are going to appear at different absolute wavelengths when generated by different excitation wavelengths whereas the photolum photoluminescence occurs at the same absolute wavelength even when different excitation wavelengths couple into the same electronic transition and this by the way is a good uh, these facts are useful in helping to determine uh, whether the band that you're detecting is a Raman band or a photoluminescence band just change the excitation wavelength and check where the peaks appear in both the Raman shift and the wavelength scales and finally that a Raman spectrometer provides high spectral resolution for photoluminescence analysis particularly of transition metals and lanthanides and so I'd like to thank you for your attention and I trust that the information presented to you in this video will help you understand photoluminescence spectroscopy using a Raman spectrometer and perhaps give you some ideas for your own experiments.